one God and Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, who was a man, who was a crucified also to us under the conscious of God. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory, the judge of the living and the dead. Whose kingdom shall have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one the baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoice and blossom like the crocus. 
It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. The waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We'll continue by reading from Psalm 146. Psalm 146. I'll read beginning with the fifth verse through verse 10. Psalm 146, beginning with verse 5. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And finally, uh, please turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, that's towards the end of the New Testament. We begin reading with the 7th verse, through verse 10. James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, writes as follows. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We'll finish our reading from God's Word here. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to Him at this time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the comfort and assurances of Your Word and the promises You make to Your people that as we trust in You, You will indeed provide for us. We thank You for the way of holiness that You've set before us through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank You that we who have come from the ends of the earth, now join the great band of Zion, going to that heavenly celestial city. 
And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we journey, we would sing uh, the glory of the Lamb and the great salvation He has accomplished. We pray that you would preserve us from evil and from harm, help us to walk in holiness, uh, trusting you and following you all our days. We thank you, O oh Father, for this church that you've blessed us with. We pray that your spirit would continue to bless the ministry here, that we would grow in Christ our Savior, be enriched by your word, strengthened in grace, and equipped to serve you in our world today. We pray for uh, those who are in need. We pray that you watch over uh, the Hamels as they travel and bless their uh, plans uh, as they get settled in up in New York in the near future. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over and provide for them. Be with Chuck's parents. We pray that your spirit be at work in their lives. And Father, we pray that you would uh, be with Avis Blakely. We thank you for her and her faith and pray that you would uh, watch over and provide for her at this time. Uh, be with Gloria Coleman. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, renew her health and watch over her. We thank you for the measure of uh, uh, renewal that she's experienced. We thank you for uh, the, the relief from the medication that she's uh, been taking, and we pray that you would continue to watch over her. We pray for Eve Thomas and pray for your blessing on her and on Larry Handy. Father, we pray for our church families that you would bless and prosper them in your ways. Uh, we pray for our children. We thank you for each one. And pray that your spirit be at work in their lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would advance uh, our work in this, in this world. Bless our witness to neighbors and friends. We pray, Lord, that through our lives we would be a light to our community. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the testimony of your church and cause many to, as it were, grab hold of our coattails and follow us to Zion. We pray for your blessing on the ministry that each one has to family and friends and workmates as well. We pray for our country. We thank you for it. We thank you for uh, those who uh, will be taking up office soon. We pray that you would prepare them for their work. We pray that you would uh, guide the president-elect and his team as they make new appointments to various offices. We pray that they would select people who uh, are uh, people of integrity, faithfulness, uh, have a love for righteousness, justice, and truth. We pray, Lord, that you would defend us from evil and from harm. And we pray that you would advance your work in this country, advance the work of your church. Uh, bless us at this time with uh, powerful preaching, with a great saving work by your Spirit. Grant a great day of repentance to our nation that we would turn from our evil ways and return to faithfulness before you and to your covenant that we might be blessed and enjoy your favor. We pray for uh, pastors who serve throughout our nation, for elders and uh, deacons. We pray that you would bless them in their work. We pray for Sunday school teachers and children. We pray that you would watch over them as well. Bless those who serve in distant lands. We pray, Lord, that you would abide by them, strengthen them and prosper them in their work as well. We thank you, Father, for your many blessings. We thank you for our fellowship with each other. We thank you for the good times that we have uh, in conversations uh, around coffee and also in our Sunday school time. We pray, Lord, that these would be times blessed by you and that we would love you and love each other. And we would ask you to teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are once more reminded that God is gracious and ready to forgive. So as we confess our sins in faith, trusting in his great work, trusting in the Messiah, Christ, who has paid the full penalty for our sins, then we have this word of assurance that as we confess our sins, he will forgive us. The Apostle John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Note the faithfulness and justice of God in the forgiveness of our sins faithful to his promises, 
and just. Can you imagine that God is just and forgiven you of your sins? It's because Jesus has paid the penalty for those sins by his death on the cross. And therefore, we receive forgiveness. Let's bring before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings.
This morning I'd like to read to you from the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and we will pick up our reading with verse 46 and read through the end of the chapter. John, excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among, among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And when, excuse me, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the uh, travels that Jesus made through Galilee and on his way to Jerusalem. And we pray that as we have occasion this morning to, as it were, listen into the conversations that occurred there, we pray that your spirit would bless these words to our hearts, that we would be strengthened by grace and equipped to serve you in our world this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our nation was saddened to learn of the passing away of uh, the first American astronaut who circled the Earth, John Glenn. I remember as a boy uh, watching the, the Mercury program, then the Gemini and Apollo programs and with great interest, having books that would uh, tell me about all the different uh, rockets and the astronauts and their adventures. And it was an amazing development in the course of time until finally we landed on the moon. I remember well, I, I, excuse me, I should say, I heard uh, a recording of John Glenn when he was in orbit saying to those on Earth uh, that uh, when you're out here and you see the universe and you look down upon the Earth the way he's able to, how can you not come away with uh, a trust in God, uh, that God is the creator of all things? John Glenn was a Christian man and he trusted that God, the creator, uh, would protect him. And he had a marvelous life. But the world has become very complicated. Not only do we have uh, people flying out into space and traveling around the Earth, but we have all kinds of things occurring on the Earth with uh, now self-driving cars and uh, computer systems that are so uh, amazing that if you post a picture on the computer, it immediately identifies who it is that's pictured in, in, in the photo. It's rather amazing. Millions and millions of people, and it picks out one person and identifies them. So, we live in a complex world, 
And it's complex not only in terms of technology, but also the, the diversity of human life across the planet. All different kinds of people, different races, different nationalities and backgrounds. Uh, many different religious beliefs as well. Even within the broad Christian church, there are wide varieties of expressions of Christian faith uh, throughout the church. Some uh, quite faithful and true, others perhaps not so. When we come to the text here in Luke's Gospel, we find that uh, the disciples and Jesus are, are coming to grips with the fact that the world is a little bit more complicated perhaps than the, that they would like, even in those rather simple times. We noted last time that as they descended from the Mount of Transfiguration, they got into the muck of the real world. And there at the foot of the mountain was a man with his son who uh, had a demon. And the disciples that remained down there uh, on a level of ground were not able to cast that demon out. And so Jesus had to provide some rebukes and drove out the demon himself. But we, we, we come along from there and we, we find that uh, the disciples are, are uh, en engrossed in an argument, no doubt some distance away from Jesus so they don't figure that he's listening into them. It would appear that there were quite a group of people following after Jesus and so maybe the um, immediate disciples of Jesus were a few paces back and they were discussing some things on their own and you can imagine uh, after Peter, James, and John went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, they probably felt that they were rather special, that they had been separated from the remainder of the disciples, and perhaps they had uh, great expectations for the future within the kingdom as they perceived it. You recall in another place, James and John have their mother come to Jesus and ask that when he comes in his kingdom, that they would be positioned on his right side and his left. And... Uh, Jesus had to address that. Here they're engaged in an argument. And, can, and if you know anything about men when they're together, they're, they're, there's a little bit of competition between them. Um, there, there's you know, those feelings of testosterone and, and kind of like, what's our, our order here? Where's the hierarchy? And, uh, and that's what you have developing here among the disciples. Who's in charge here? Who's in first place here? Who, who's responsible for this and that? And so... The, the disciples are trying to sort all this out and, and looking to the future perhaps and probably making some case as to what their place ought to be within the coming kingdom. Well, Jesus, not within earshot, but knows what's going on as he reads their hearts. You see, Luke gives us immediately uh, this perception that Jesus is one who knows the human heart. He perceives what we're thinking, the reason that's going on within us. And so just in, in, in just such a quiet, simple way, he points to the divine nature of Jesus. Luke's gospel presents Jesus as fully God and fully man. Without any mixture or, or conflation of the two natures. And he's able to see what's going on in people's hearts. Luke's opinion of Jesus, therefore, is much different from many today who would recognize him as a man like us, but he had his failures and his weaknesses and all that kind of thing, and certainly wasn't fully God and fully man. Maybe he had a spark of divinity within him, as we all do in that modern mindset. But Luke perceived Jesus differently. And so Jesus sees what's going on, and rather than asking them what they were talking about, he right away goes over and, and takes one of the children who are following along. So he got some families walking along with Jesus, and they got kids running around as well. And Jesus takes this child and walks up to the disciples and perhaps sits in front of them with this child and brings a little bit of an object lesson, lesson to them. Um, he, he asks, he presents to them this child, let me, my mind is, growing weak with age. I want to make sure I get this correct. He brings the, the child in front of them and he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now this, it's an assertion. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. 
For he who is least among you is the one who is great. He urges the disciples to be ready to receive a little child. Now, men are not naturally disposed to pay a lot of attention to children. They've got work to do. You remember that when uh, women were bringing their children to Jesus and they wanted his attention, they wanted him to bless the children, the disciples came up and said, no, no, leave the master alone. And Jesus said, forbid not the children to come. So Jesus had regard for children. You set an example here. But note what Jesus says in particular. If you receive this little child, you receive me. This kind of turns everything that the disciples were discussing up on end. Who is the greatest? The one with the greatest accomplishments? The one with the greatest talents? The one with the, the, the um, most influence? receives this child in my name, receives me. And so Jesus identifies, identifies himself so much with this child that if we are to serve the Lord Jesus, then we need to be able to serve this child in that regard for children. Now this is something of a metaphor. It's not so much an argument for children's ministries, although that's obviously the case. We ought to be concerned for children of every stage. But it goes beyond that to all who are weak, all who seem to be out of this real order, who, who don't have a whole lot to contribute, if you will, outwardly. Nonetheless, if they're Christ's children, if they belong to Christ, then we need to see Christ in them and be prepared to serve them and not just push them aside. Remember James in his letter, the brother of Jesus, warns the church about those who uh, find a great place for the wealthy and the powerful, but when the poor come in, they say, who besides that this person here can have a nice seat? Uh, that's not the attitude that the disciples should have. There should be a, a kind of humility and a graciousness towards even the poor, the weak, the helpless. And so Jesus gives us new eyes as to how we look on one another. We don't look at each other in terms of our talents and gifts and, and abilities so much as our union with Christ. And that transforms the way we should relate to each other. Well, as I was trying to say at the beginning of the sermon, we, the world is complex and things are not always the way we would like them to be. We would like to have everything ordered and under control. And so we want the best people in the best positions and we want them to have control over thing and ordering everything correctly. But here Jesus says, pay attention to the children. And then you have another situation where somebody's kind of out of order, not cooperating. They haven't gone to the right schools. They haven't gotten the, the, the proper degrees. They haven't uh, been ordained properly, but they're out there preaching. Here's a guy who's out, not with the disciples, but he's out Casting out demons in Jesus' name. Well, it's kind of a wonder how that happens. I, I read many years ago, back in my days at seminary, back in the old days, when uh, I, I read a book about the, um, how's it called? The, the expansion of the church. It's kind of the natural uh, expansion of the church. It doesn't happen so much by planned ordering as spontaneous. That's the word I was trying to get. Spontaneous expansion of the church. And we have our plans and our structures and our programs as to how we anticipate that the church is going to grow, but God often works outside those things to accomplish his own purposes. Remember Abraham out there uh, rescuing Lot. And here comes this guy named Melchizedek. Where is he in the program of redemption? Where was he in the, the line of, a, a, of the household of faith? Well, he just kind of was out there. And then where's Job come in in the old, old common scriptures? I don't think he's a descendant of Abraham. Some think that he probably lived about the same time as Abraham. God works sometimes outside the boundaries of what we would expect. And so for us, it's a little bit hard to deal with. We want control, we want order, we want discipline. 
So here's this guy casting out demons, and the disciples look at him and say, hey, you're not following us. Stop doing that. You need to be discipled. You need to follow Jesus more carefully. You need to be a part of our mutual fellowship here. You need to be part of our denomination, if you will. You need to be part of our regular order of things. And what does Jesus do? I, I, I kind of like, I, I find it interesting as a former salesperson, which was an advocation, not my vocation. But we used to have a saying that you assume the sale. When a customer comes in, you don't try to reason with them as to why they should buy that particular mattress or that set of furniture. You, you assume you, you need a mattress, okay, and you need something that's going to relieve those pressure points in your back, keep your back aligned properly, give you a great night's sleep, right? Yes, yes. We have a wonderful mattress for you here. Come to the desk. Let's sign up and get you. It can be arrived. It can arrive in one week or a couple days, what have you. You assume the sale. And what Jesus does is something like that. He says to the disciples who wanted to, to, to restrain this man, he says, he who is not against you is for you. Now that's kind of a, a little bit different. And a couple chapters later, he's going to talk about people saying, do you cast out demons by the power of Beelzebul? By, by, by the devil himself. And Jesus there would say, whoever's not with me is against me. And that seems to be put it in a, a different perspective. Allegiance to Jesus is everything. And if you're not with me, if you're not positively following me, then you're against me. Here it's a little bit of a different approach. And the focus is not so much on Jesus, but on the disciples. Whoever's not against you is for you. And I think it, it, it suggests that we should be rather open to the variety of ways in which God works in the world today. It doesn't always work through the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and its ministry. There are a wide variety of churches, a wide variety of ministries through which God is pleased to work. And rather than restraining them, let's try to work together. And hopefully we'll all end up as Orthodox Presbyterians. <laughs> Well, maybe <coughs> But the church of the Lord is a big thing. Lots of people involved from a variety of perspectives. All different kinds of backgrounds. It's cluttered. It's messy, if you will, in a certain sense. But he who's not against you is for you. Welcome them in. And so J Jesus uh, uh, addresses that matter. And, and then next... It, next set of verses you have Jesus uh, making plans to, to head towards Jerusalem. And now, as I had said some time ago, this is a pivotal point in the Gospel of Luke where he turns from his greater Galilean ministry to the north and begins setting his eyes fixed on Jerusalem. And you recall in, in the last sermon, Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus and talk about his exodus that he's going to have there in Jerusalem. Here, the word is his ascension. The ascension that is going to be at Jerusalem. And there are a variety of ways perhaps for interpreting that. Everything from simply going up the hill to the city of Jerusalem to his being lifted up on the cross, a different sort of ascension. Or finally, his resurrection and ascension into heaven and glorification, which is probably more than likely what's in view. But you see, Jesus has his focus now fixed on Jerusalem, knowing full well what awaits him there, his rejection from his people and the leadership of that day, and his crucifixion. Jesus understood that. But his mind was fixed. His eyes were set on going to Jerusalem. And he takes the shortest route possible, which brings him right through the region of Samaria. Many times those who are traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem would skirt around Samaria and then come around to Jerusalem. It was a longer trip, but it avoided the conflict because the Samaritans were something of a mixed breed, mixed religiously, mixed uh, racially as well. And there was hostility. Remember the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4 said, we worship at Mount Gerizim and you worship at Jerusalem. What's the proper place? There, there were religious disputes there between them. 
And so Jesus, rather than going the long way around to Jerusalem, taking his good old time, has his face fixed on Jerusalem, determined to go and face what was before him. Do you see what he did for you? Fully understanding what awaited him. Nothing would get in his way. He would go to Jerusalem. Think about him. Hallelujah. What? Let's see. So Jesus, being polite and considerate, sends disciples in advance to a village in Samaria. And the villagers, learning that he is headed to Jerusalem, don't want to dirty their hands with this Jew. They refuse to offer him any hospitality or any assistance on his way to Jerusalem. And so Jesus, the disciples have to come back to Jesus and report this to them. They won't accept you there at this village. We've got to make our way further. We don't know exactly what he did. Maybe he camped out at, at, outside at night with his disciples and made their way along the road. But the disciples came back. And, and now you got James and John who are perturbed, upset, and you can understand why. Now, James and John had just seen Elijah a moment ago, a little while ago. And maybe that experience is still on their mind, but they, they see the rejection of the Samaritans of Jesus, and they turn to him and say, Shall we not call out to heaven for fire to come down from heaven to consume them? You remember Elijah demonstrated the, the truthfulness of the true God by God being the one who answers by fire from heaven and consuming the altar and the sacrifice there of Mount Carmel. And so they went this big event. They went the judgments of God upon these people who rejected Jesus. And Jesus here is very careful. He says, uh, he rebukes them. And then they go along on their way. Now, some of your translations, the King James will have a little bit more than just simply the rebuke and say, you do not know what spirit you are of. Um, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy, but to save. And that certainly gets at the, the sentiment or the, the, the idea of what is at hand here. The purpose of Jesus was not to bring in the final judgment. Um, remember, he rebuked Chorism and Bethsaida. And said, if Sodom and Gomorrah were here, they would have repented long ago in dust and ashes instead of you. Woe to you. But he doesn't call fire from heaven and destroy them right there. He's gracious and patient. With these Samaritans, he understands and knows that it's not so much that they're hostile to Jesus, as they're hostile to this religious rabbi going to Jerusalem with all of this crowd. They don't want to be participant in that. So he doesn't bring the judgments of God and the curse down upon them. He's more gracious than that. And so they pass along their way. Finally, as we pursue the, the final leg of the journey, Jesus is finding people coming up to him. And one's coming along he said, and says, I will follow you wherever you go. Perhaps we've had that sort of expression or thought to our minds when we come to faith in Christ. I'll follow you wherever you go. But do you always understand what that might mean for you? It may not be the most glamorous place where God wants you to serve. It might be some rather humble places to serve. Jesus said that the Son of Man does not, I mean the foxes have holes and the, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Imagine the humility of the Son of God walking in our humanity and not having any place to sleep at night. And just illustrated by his rejection by the Samaritan village. No place to lay my head. Are you ready for that? What is your level of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? Another one says, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bury my, my dead, my dead father. Now, 
some are a little bit disturbed that Jesus would say, don't go bury your dead. Let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me. You come and preach the gospel. You preach the kingdom. That seems rather rude. And so it's more than likely, at least most are of the opinion, that when this man said, let me bury my dead father, is that you saying, let me hang around here until my father passes on. And maybe he's fairly close. Maybe it's a few months. Maybe it's a year or so or before likely he'll pass. He wants to wait until that event has transpired. And then he'll pick up and follow after Jesus. But Jesus impresses upon us the urgency of the kingdom and service in Christ's church. We have to abandon all allegiances and follow after Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we have no responsibility to our parents or our families or what have you. We do. We follow those responsibilities and we serve them before the Lord. But it all has to come under the rubric of what Christ demands of us. And so we can't put family up above what Christ commands us to do. We have to be very careful. And finally, uh, we have the, this, this last individual. And, uh, the last individual comes up to Jesus and says, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus responds, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. We can't be looking back. Remember the, the Jews as they left Egypt, looked back to the leeks and garlics of Egypt. And when they were out in the wilderness and didn't have all that, that fancy, if you will, fancy food, they were getting a little bit homesick and thinking, well, what have we left behind? And thinking, maybe... I had it better when I was back in Egypt. And that's a temptation for us after we come to faith in Christ and that has transformed our life. And perhaps there have been some problems that have occurred because of our confession of faith in Christ that have made life difficult for us. And we think to ourselves, well, you know, maybe I had it better when I didn't do this. <laughs> maybe I, I was better liked by my family and friends when I didn't follow Jesus. But now, in taking up this cross, this is getting to be a bit of a challenge. Christ tells us we can't look back. Once we put our hands to the plow, we have to look straight ahead to where that plow needs to go. You look back and you're going to start turning all over the place. Keep your eyes fixed on where Jesus wants you to go so that you may accomplish his purposes. We live in a complex world, and things are not always as neat and tidy as we would like them to be. And our loyalties, our commitments, are not always as, as plain, as clear to us as what they should be. What we need to learn from these things is first that we need to have an attitude of humility, a readiness to serve the weak, the humble, the lowly, even children. In Jesus' name, because of who they are as united to Christ. I, I think, you know, when, when you think of that, and here's an illustration that I should have given earlier. When you think of the littlest ones in the church, you think, okay, well, who, who has the, the most difficult job in the church? Well, maybe it's the church janitor who has to go around and clean the bathrooms and clean the toilets and wash the floor and these kinds of things, keeps everything clean. How important is that person who does that? You would find out if they didn't do that job for a few weeks. And so, you see, everyone is vital and important to the life of the church. I know it's a humorous kind of thing to think about, but really, everyone is important. Everyone has a role to play in the life of the church. And so, no matter what your calling is, whether it's washing windows, uh, all, all kinds of things. It's vital and important. And you belong to Christ. And your service is to be valued and appreciated. So we serve the Lord with humility. And then we serve the Lord with a certain graciousness of heart and mind. Recognizing that the kingdom of God is not 
begin and end with me, or with my congregation, or with my denomination. It goes well beyond that. God continues his work in big ways, in marvelous ways that are larger than who we are. And finally, we need to serve the Lord with full commitment and great faithfulness that we might be to his glory and praise. And then we will join him with his ascension, uh, an ascension to glory, even through the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today and pray that your spirit would work that graciousness and humility within us that we need to care for each other, uh, to serve one another as we ought, and not to be too high-minded or to think too much of ourselves. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in, in our fellowship with you and with each other, and we ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. The final hymn this morning is hymn number 634. We praise thee, O God. Number 634, let's stand as we sing. <laughs>